Hi, everyone. Hello. So we just wanted to first thank um, JP for uh, letting us come to this event. We first met JP in Toronto um, a few years ago. And John and I uh, said, well, if uh, Food on the Edge and if Ireland is any reflection of uh, who JP is, then we would be thrilled to come to this event. So thank you for inviting thank us. Thank you. <laughs> So we wanted to start you off with a little uh, brief overview of Canada, and I think we have a clicker. Oh, yes. There we go. <laughs> I have a role. Um, so after our overview of Canada, we'll roll into our story about our plan for opening, a, how our plan uh, for opening a restaurant turned into a journey of collaboration, helping to shape the young culinary frontier of the city and province that we now live in. Okay, so... Who's been to Canada here? Oh, is that our Canadian contingency over there? <laughs> so we travel in packs, guys. So, I mean, when I lived in, I'm from Canada, but I lived in the States for 10 years. And when I lived in the US, um, whenever I told people that I was from Calgary, I got usually two responses. Um, one was, what state is that in? And another one was, is Calgary near Toronto? And I really believe that's uh, something that is our, our own fault because, you know, um, it's nobody's fault but our own. You know, we've neglected to share with the rest of the world essentially our identity. And what an amazing country that we, we have. And, you know, this is, this is going to be a conversation about how cool Canada is, guys. So get ready. Um, some fun facts about uh, Canada, we'll start it off, just uh, so you guys know where we're coming from. Um, basketball was invented by a Canadian. Did you guys know that? Okay. I googled this this morning. Um, th this may be aging myself, but the most famous Canadian movie was Porky's. Does anyone know Porky's? All right, see? Or Porky's Revenge. Okay. Not so good, but Porky's was. Um, our tap water in Canada is better quality than all bottled water. Well, at least that's what they tell us to say. Um, Alberta, which is where we live, uh, is the only place in the world that is rat free. Okay? I know this is hard to believe, but you guys can Google this. We have a rat patrol. We actually, the government pays for these people to keep rats outside of our province, okay? Google it, you don't believe me. All right, so Canada is the second largest country in the world, but 90% of the country is uninhabited with the other 10% of the population living along the borders and coastlines. It's made up of oceans, both on the east and west coast. Look at that. John drew those pictures. <laughs> Mountainous regions throughout Alberta and BC. That's where we live right there. Prairies, which consists of Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And microclimate valleys and lakes, also in BC and Ontario. Now just add cultural influences from all Ooh. over the world. Check it out. And we get a unique Canadian cuisine that is very regionalized and cannot solely be defined. So as you can see, we made a map to show you the regions of Canada, identifying the ingredients and cultural influences in them. That was not easy to make, just an FYI. <laughs> From the cod fishery of Newfoundland and the farm and wild game of the prairies, all the way to the Rocky Mountains and microclimates of British Columbia and beyond. We've got mountains where we forage, hunt wild game, and pick forest fire mushrooms. That has not been filtered, guys. That's the real picture. And that's about an hour from where we live. We've got Great Lakes in, in Canada, and some of the greatest freshwater fishing in the world 
with over two million lakes in our country. Two million, that's a lot of lakes. See, I told you I have a part to this speech, right? <laughs> First of all, I push the button, and then whenever I feel like it, I add content. <laughs> okay. Then we have the prairies, which is one of the largest exporter of grains in the world. Many smaller producers are bringing back the farming heritage of grains like Red Fife. So this is, this is where my family is from, and I mean, there's a lot of stories and uh, jokes about the prairies, but one is that if your dog runs away from home, you can see it for the next three weeks because it's so flat. There's no... <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. It's true. My dog ran away from home. I was like, come on. Come back. And then we have microclimates with nutrient-rich valleys in Ontario, Quebec, and BC, home to fruit orchards and vineyards. And of course, fisheries. From the east to the west coast, we have a large fishery industry. And just as many of you in this room, our Canadian chefs are bringing attention to issues surrounding our oceans, and we have created a program called Ocean Wise that is educating us on sustainability and good practices to keep our oceans healthy. Yes, I think that do deserves a round of applause. Yeah. Okay, so now is some of my part, I guess. Um, so, I mean, back to our journey. So, moving back home from New York and San Francisco, where we were for the last 10 years to open our restaurant in, in Calgary, I mean, we were a little freaked out. I mean, it was a big decision for us to, to move back home. I mean, we knew that we were going to have the support of our friends, the family, and we had an incredible network. But what was the food culture like? It was 10 years since we were there last. So, our, I mean, it was... What, what were we going to discover, right? So it was an adventure, but that adventure really began with a plan. We wanted to first reintroduce ourselves to the, the culinary community, and, uh, you know, Connie and I um, decided to uh, get the phone book, and we went through and we found all the restaurants we could in, in Calgary, and we called up the restaurants, not during service time. And... Uh, we asked to talk to the chef, and we organized this potluck in Connie's family's backyard where we ended up, uh, you know, uh, convincing random people that we've never met before to join us. And it was on a Sunday, so a lot of the chefs were off, and we invited them and their families to come to this potluck and bring food and, and just really reintroduce ourselves to the, to, to the community. And uh, we were very surprised that over... 70 chefs and their families ended up showing up and it was uh, it was incredible we had like a little goat petting zoo for the kids and milking goats and connie was making cheese and there was hair in the cheese and you know hair. goat hair <laughs> and uh you know there was a fridge smoker with sausage going in it some brought sausage we had a big rotisserie and we had this big communal table that went throughout her family's yard and everyone was sitting there breaking bread and and, you know, some people haven't seen each other for years and some people never met. And it was a really incredible celebration. And that was something that was really important to, to us moving back home was that collaborative spirit. And then before we even set, uh, you know, before we even started building the restaurant, we, we set out to, we call it 40 farms in 40 days, but I really don't know how many days. And there are a lot of farms, but... Uh, we went out to, to meet the people, the, the, the farmers, ranchers, the artists and producers, and to get to know who we were, this is where we decided to, to build our, our lives and our business. And, you know, to this day, we, we uh, you know, we're dealing with uh, pretty much all of the same people. And it's, uh, it's been over six years. So it, it, we wanted to have that foundation before we even started building a restaurant, because for us, that was uh, critical. So after a year of figuring out our new restaurant and continuing to cultivate relationships with other chefs and suppliers, we felt that we could do more to help shape our culinary culture that at the time was very young and impressionable. We continued to push forward and began to look for opportunities to collaborate. But this time, it was either bringing chefs in from other destinations 
or us going out and spreading the word about how cool Alberta was. Like right now. <laughs> our belief was that if we were to, I'm sorry, our belief was if we were to get culinary, our culinary scene recognized on a global scale, then we would need to showcase why we were unique and that we had something to offer. This continued way outside of our day-to-day -day operations at our restaurant. From helping establish the new Alberta Culinary Tourism Alliance, funded by our government, where John sits on the board, to helping to bring international chefs to our backyard where people from all around the world would leave with a lasting impression, like Cook It Raw and Brewery and the Beast, working with our government to cut through the red tape in creating tiers of food culture, like getting our first food trucks on the street. We went from zero food trucks to over 40 in our first year, providing accessible farm-to-table fast food. And continuing to work with true Canadian tastemakers, like our friends Arlene and Rebecca, who are here today with their own incredible event, Terroir Symposium in Toronto. <laughs> yeah! And other projects looking at the bigger picture. This winter, we're sitting on a panel to discuss Canadian culinary tourism in Ottawa, thanks to Rebecca. Our goal is to create a line of communication among chefs within the region and forge links internationally laying the framework for a long-lasting culinary network with truly intimate relationships where we have the same messaging, unique experiences, and stories to tell. So I remember we were just last week, we were having a, a conversation with uh, uh, Elizabeth Faulkner, a chef, about, about the influences we have as chefs and the incredible ability to make impact in our communities. Um, like so many of you have mentioned in, in your talks, I think pretty much everybody has. Uh, as chefs, we have a voice, and for some reason, you know, everyone wants to listen. So we're using that voice to share our stories about Canada and Alberta, and we want to bring it to a global scale. And at the same time, you know, we want to make a lot of positive impact in our communities. So, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. So we just wanted to mention some of our peers in Canada that have been pioneers and advocates throughout our Canadian industry. Their leadership has been the fuel to push us forward, lay down a strong and united foundation across our own regional culinary community with hopes to soon link it all together. Some of them are here today, Arlene and Rebecca with Terroir Symposium and Ontario Culinary Tourism. Terroir, which many of you have attended throughout the years, will be celebrating its 10-year anniversary this year. Nick Saul of community food centers that are popping up all across Canada, that envisions a Canada where everyone has the means and knowledge necessary to access good, healthy food in a dignified way. Chefs Jeremy Charles and Todd Perrin for showing us how incredible Newfoundland is and advocating your own local culture so it is showcased on a global scale. And the people at OceanWise, also Chef Ned Bell, and his 10-week-long bike journey across the country, creating awareness about our oceans and helping to keep them healthy for generations to come. And to all our friends in Montreal, showcasing hospitality at its finest, Dave and Fred at Joe Beef, Derek Damon, and of course, Martin at Aubier de Cochon. And to the old radicals who got it all started for us, Jamie Kennedy, Michael Statlander, and Anita Stewart of Food Day Canada. So as a community, we are taking it one step further and have begun the process of looking to our past and the First Nation roots as we shape our own culinary frontier. Here's a short video that captures a part of the recent Cook at Raw Alberta event. It should give you a glimpse of our own backyard and heritage. You got it. Going back to what, back to the basics of life and how 
how we take all the technology and everything out of the equation and just go back to the bare bones and just trying to live off the land, I think is a well experience to um, partake in. There was no distractions from the, from the sun to us and how the days went. So it's a blessing in disguise, as you would say. Sometimes we need to stop and and just stop and realize where we're at, because sometimes life is too fast. Life is too, living it too fast, you sometimes lose your way in what you're doing. And it takes time. It takes a lot of people, a lot of time, just to get used to something and, and take that time just for yourself. As if you cut yourself, it takes time to heal. Everybody felt at ease of knowing that how the land could take care of you if you just give it a chance to let you take care of it. They felt that spirit and they felt open, they felt calm, they felt at home, they felt that it was the right place at the right time to what they needed to do and needed to share. And that's a spirit of love and respect and also kindness that come in and tapped them on the shoulder and blew it into their hearts and their, their bodies and what it's a good place not to worry. And that's what I felt and, and I knew they would take home something good with them. They will have something to carry with them for the rest of their days. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.